Morning, Reggie Sharks. How's everybody doing this morning? I have a card here I'm going to read. It says, Refuge Church Family, thank you all so very much for allowing us to use the church for our dad's special going home service. Thanks also for the beautiful, I'm sorry, for the beautiful, uh, thank, oh, I can see now. <laughs> sorry, I know that's my fault. That was next to his, I'm sorry, next to his memory. Dad and our family shared so many precious and wonderful memories of our years at Refuge. We could think of no more better place to honor and celebrate his life. Thanks to all who arranged and prepared Good for our food for our home and at the church. It was truly an awesome meal. Thank you, Pastor Steve, for letting, for being there to help us with the uh, the flowers and the special prayer with our family before the service. It sorry, it brought peace and comfort. Thanks to all our refuge family for being there for us with you and in being with us in our prayers. Refuge and so many gifts above. May the Lord bless each of you with a special blessing for your kindness. Sorry for my inability to read. Uh, this is the family of Clarence Cornish. Okay, would y'all join me today in our scripture reading? Today is a Romans chapter 8, starting in verse 14 to 27, where it says, For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The spirit you receive does not make you slaves, so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may bring also his glory. I consider that our present suffering, sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it. In hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to this present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But we hope for what we do not yet have. We wait Patient. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And He who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. Let's go to God in prayer this morning. Through Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for this day that you've given us. We thank you for everything that you're doing in this church. We thank you for what you are going to do through us, God, in spite of us. God, we love you so much. Help us to be more attentive to what you have for us this morning. Please, God, just bless uh, Brother Steve as he brings the message you have prepared in him. God, that it wouldn't be him speaking this morning, but it would be you speaking through him. Just use us as vessels, God. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. It was Wednesday, 12.20 a.m. in the morning. I don't know if it was like this at your house, but the rain was hitting hard on our window in our bedroom. Loud enough where it woke me up, and if it wakes me up, it's got to be pretty loud. I right away reached over for my uh, phone. I checked the weather app to show that there might be some stormy weather on the way or already there. I decided to see if there was anything else going on, and I noticed that a church member had posted something on Facebook 
just shortly before that, maybe only 15, 20 minutes before, asking for prayer, emergency prayer. Well, my heart kind of fell a little bit because I knew of the situation and I was a little bit worried. Next thing I know, I saw a text message that had been on my phone for a while. And I read the text message and talked about a church member who had had an awful fall that had been transported to Memphis. My heart broke once again. Both of these things, while the rain was hitting hard, and I began to walk to the restroom. Next thing I know, my phone buzzes again. What is going on? It's only about 12.30 in the morning. I received a text from someone else in our church. A text that said their father had passed away. I started to respond. As I started to respond, my phone buzzed again, this time with an emergency alert, tornado warning. Well, we're not from this area. There's a shelter we're told we're supposed to get into out back, and we checked it out before. We're like, I don't know about this. <laughs> we're like, okay, I guess that's where we're supposed to go. And so we start panicking. At first, we're looking up and trying to figure out is this really a tornado here, possibly? And we confirm that, yes, it says Craighead County that there was a tornado warning. So we're all scrambling around, waking each other up, grabbing things that we thought we might need because we didn't have anything prepared by the back door like we probably should. Next thing I know, I hear my wife crying. I'm wondering what's going on now. My wife to check out and look outside to see how the storm was and what it was going to be like walking through the floodwaters of the backyard to the shelter, my wife, the wind catches hold of the screen door and the glass pane falls out and falls on top of her foot. My wife is now writhing in pain and can't move and her foot, her foot is automatically swelling. So we're all running around like crazy people. I've got on my mind, I've got a text to send back because someone's struggling and there's someone else who's in Memphis and that there's all these things going on or going wrong. And then all my family is in the shelter. Now it's my time to get in the shelter. And how did they expect someone who's not little to even duck and get in there? <laughs> I'm trying to figure out how to contort to step down. Do I take a step first? Do I crawl in the head first? I just wasn't sure what to do. We get down there, we latch everything up, and here we are sitting. And I guess because of uh, you know the trunk or treat that was out there, someone messed with some stuff at the top, so there was water that was actually dripping down into the shelter that hadn't been fixed. And here we are in this little cramped concrete spot with our blankets, with our dog who is terrified, wondering what's going on. So we got to bring the dog. And we're sitting there, and I'm thinking, okay. What do I do? What is going on? And I looked at the shelter, and I remember earlier that week, my wife had a book that she was reading, and it said, A Shelter in the Time of Storm. And I started thinking about this idea of there being a shelter in the time of storm during suffering. And I've got to be honest with you. My mind didn't go to praise God for a shelter. It went, whose idea was this? <laughs> I start thinking quite often, God says he is our shelter, but it doesn't mean that it's going to be beautiful. It doesn't mean that everything's going to look the way we want it. It doesn't mean that everything's going to be comfortable in this life. Here I am cramped in the shelter realizing, yes, if a tornado comes through, supposedly we're safe in this hole, but this sure isn't a glorious place to be right now. I thought of the song, the Lord's our rock, in him we hide. A shelter in the time of storm. Secure whatever ill be tied. A shelter in the time of storm. And I have this question for you. Have you ever struggled with this idea? Let's be honest for a minute. Have you ever struggled with the idea of where is God when it hurts? Did he cause this to happen? Why would he allow someone to fall and break these bones when this person obviously didn't <coughs> expect for this to happen nor want for this to happen? Why would God allow someone who is near and dear to us to pass away? Why would someone have to be diagnosed with cancer? Why is there a tornado in the first place? <coughs> Did he cause this? You know, the Bible does tell us, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find, knock and the door will be opened to you. 
Have you ever struggled in your prayers and just asked God, why? Why, God? Why would you allow this? Does he listen? Does he even care? C.S. Lewis responded and said this, Knock and it shall be opened, but does knocking mean hammering and kicking the door like a maniac? Here we think of C.S. Lewis who had everything put together, but he's got two books out there that are incredible books because he shows that even as a Christian, there are times where we stop and we wonder, does God even care? Is he a monster? Did he cause this to happen in the first place? And even if he didn't cause it, why would he allow this terrible thing or what we see as terrible happen? We may ask the question, why is there so much pain and suffering in the world? Is God simply a monster who visits mayhem, destruction, and death on innocent people? Why is there suffering of any kind? And why would a so-called good God allow suffering? So it brings us to the question. If you've done it, and I've done it, or you might do it one day, is it even okay to ask these God's questions? And where might the asking lead us? I believe... As a Christian, one who chooses to believe, I believe it's important for us to tackle the hard questions, for us to ask questions like, you know what, I see God in the Old Testament, we say God is three in one, so God the Father, although it may be confusing, we trust him and he is the Son, so Jesus and God are the same. But have you ever read the Old Testament and it seems like there's this angry, violent, mean, vicious God? who is violent, who is angry, who can care less, who it seems like he's all about himself. And then you come over here, and here's God by the New Testament where he's all about peace and love. I don't know about you if you've ever asked the question, is that God in the Old Testament the same God in the New Testament? Is it okay to even ask those questions? That's the reason for this sermon series. The idea, is God a monster? Here's what C.S. Lewis, again, in another one of his books, The Brief Observed, shared. He says, not that I am, I think, in much danger of ceasing to believe in God when I ask these questions. The real danger is of coming to believe such dreadful things about him. The conclusion I dread is not, so there's no God after all, but, so this is what God's really like? Deceive yourself no longer. He said it's a scary thing when we start questioning God. But in all honesty, we will never completely understand God, but it's our duty and we ought to ask the hard questions. Is he the same God? 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 12 says this. For now, talking about right now, we see only a reflection as in a mirror. But then one day we shall see face to face. We don't understand completely right now, but the Bible says one day we will understand. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. So does that mean that God is a vicious God and he doesn't mean for us to understand anything about our suffering on this side of the earth? Does it really come down to one day in heaven I'll completely understand? No, I believe God has given us his word to encourage us and help us through the sufferings, to answer the questions, did he cause us? To answer the questions, is he apathetic or does he really care? You know, I believe some of our biggest Bible hangups come from not understanding two things. And this is in your notes. From not understanding the context and the culture surrounding the hard to swallow scriptures we stop and choke on. Context and culture. Quite often, whenever we're reading a scripture and you get hung up and you're questioning God, you've got to understand when you're studying your Bible two specific things. And we're going to bring this up over the next few weeks. Number one is the context. Context means what is surrounding. Here goes my glasses. What is surrounding the scripture? So you look at the other scriptures. You look at the scriptures before and afterward and ask yourself, why is this here for? Why did God put this here? Quite often, we can take things out of context. We can just say, this is what it means by itself, and we can completely miss what the scripture is saying. We've got to see what is going on in the context. 
all around it. What is going on in the culture? Who was it written to? What was going on at that time? Why would that be important that the scriptures were speaking to them at that place? And then how can I apply it to my life? Quite a few of us will really get mixed up and confused if we do what? We don't pay attention to the context and we don't pay attention to the culture. You see, the Bible is God's progressive revelation of his true self, his ultimate desire. We're going to hear over the next couple weeks, next week we'll be talking about, is God a violent God? And we're going to notice something. There is a progression. Not a progression because God has changed. It's because slowly God has tried to change man. He's always been the way Jesus is. It's trying to get man there that has been the difficulty. You start in the very Old Testament whenever he says certain things about anger, when he says certain things about violence, when he says certain things, what he's trying to do is take them where they're at and giving his grace and slowly getting them to where he wants us to be. We're going to understand this a little bit more as we look through these scriptures in the future. I wrote this down. God had to meet man where they were at and bring them closer to restoration and his will. And so some of those confusing things in the Old Testament where we say, God allowed that or he was okay with that, he wasn't. He ultimately wanted this over here. So if he could get my man just a little bit closer to what he wanted, he said, okay, I'll prove that right now. It'll help you understand the scriptures if you understand the context and the culture. Here's an example. How did God address Israel's patriarchal structures? The rights of the firstborn, polygamy, warfare, servitude, and slavery. All these social arrangements that were permitted by man. He simply, he met Israel halfway. Because halfway was a little bit closer to what ultimately God wanted. He met them halfway. He gave them grace and said, okay, I will agree to this law, although I would like it to be this. At least this is a lot closer than what uh, you had it being. As one writer puts it, if human beings are to be treated as real human beings who possess the power of choice, then the better way must come gradually. Timothy Keller said this, God will allow evil only to the degree that it brings about the very opposite of what it intends. That's understanding the context and the culture. But let's talk about today's subject. Let's talk about suffering. Our first thing I want to talk about, because you've got to understand this before you can understand the rest of it, is the beginning of suffering. The beginning of suffering. So here's our big God question when we talk about the beginning of suffering. Why didn't God merely create a world where tragedy and suffering didn't exist? The answer is, he did. He did create a world like that. I put in your notes, God is not the creator of evil and suffering. For you to understand God, you must first understand that this was not what God wanted. Genesis 1.31, God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. You see, love is the highest value in the universe. The Bible says God is love. He can't help it. It is who he is. When God decided to create human beings, he wanted us to do what? Experience love. But to give us the ability to love... God had to give us free will to decide whether to love or not to love. Why? Because love always involves a choice. Love involves a choice. So it's not too hard to understand. The way I would illustrate it whenever I would talk to younger teenagers or children was I'd explain to them, what if you needed a best friend and you didn't have a best friend? What if you had the capability of building a robot? Building something that looked a little bit like human, maybe treated you like human, but you could program it to be your best friend. And every time you wanted to play ball, he was there to play ball with you. Every time you needed encouragement, he would be there. Wow, you look good this morning. Because you're programmed in that way. You are my friend. But what would happen with that? Would you really walk away feeling like I have been loved? No. 
True love is what? Someone made the choice to love you and say, I love you and I care. And God gave that to us. In so doing, he gave us this free will that, yes, he knew was going to get a little bit messy. I like what one person wrote to kind of explain this uh, just a little bit. I, I wrote a couple things down. God bestowed on, on us free will, but fortunately, we humans have abused our free will by rejecting God and walking away from him. And that has resulted in the introduction of evil in the world. Some people ask, couldn't God have foreseen all this? And no doubt he did. One pastor said this, look at it this way. Many of you are parents. Even before you had children, couldn't you foresee that there was a very real possibility they may suffer disappointment or pain or heartache in life, or that they might even hurt you and walk away from you? Of course, but you still had kids. Why? Because you knew there was also the potential for tremendous joy and deep love and great meaning. God knew we'd rebel against him. But he also knew many people would choose to follow him and have a relationship with him and spend eternity in heaven with him. And it was all worth it for that, even though it would cost his son great pain and suffering to achieve our redemption. So as we ponder the mystery of pain and evil, we need to be mindful that God did not create them. Creation only became broken after sin. The problem of pain does not rest on God. It rests squarely on the shoulders of sinful mankind in rebellion against the Creator. Death, evil, and suffering are the result of living in a sin-cursed world. In the biblical view, death is a natural part of our world. It's actually an intruder and an enemy. And so whenever someone dies, we need to be reminded of this. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, after his, and he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. See what the Bible calls death? It's the enemy. It's not ultimately what God wanted. We talked about it before on a Sunday morning. This idea, we heard it in our scripture this morning. That all of creation groans. It's in misery until one day heaven makes all things perfect. Because there is imperfection brought about because of sin. Romans chapter 8, 19 through 25. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subject to frustration. Not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it. Man, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to gay decay, and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning, as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. Face it. People hurting people accounts for much of the suffering of humanity. It is people, not God, who produces the wars, bombs, whips, racks, prisons, torture, and so on. It is people who pollute and destroy the environment thus helping add to more adverse weather patterns. And it is human selfishness, not the workings of nature, that explain much of the poverty and suffering that already exists. So the beginning of suffering, we've got to realize that God is not the creator of evil and suffering. So what about the future of suffering? I know what many of you are saying, what about the now? We're going to get there. The future of suffering. Romans 8, verses 16 through 19. You can go back to Romans 8 if you're struggling with this idea of suffering and maybe read through it all week long, just verse by verse. So many great verses in Romans chapter 8. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now if we are children, then we are heirs. We're talking about future. 
heirs with God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with what? With the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits an eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. Remember these words were written by the Apostle Paul, who suffered through beatings, through stonings, through shipwrecks, through imprisonments, and rejection, and hunger, and thirst, and homelessness. Far more pain than many of us have or ever will endure. And yet he says what? There is a future to suffering that I can look forward to. I've had you put this in your notes. Our suffering will pale, the Bible says, in comparison to the good things God has in store for his followers. Amen? Amen. So let me ask you a question. How was your year 2017? I know that may be a while back, but whenever you look back at your last year, if you had a bad day or some bad things happen, for most of us, you could have an extremely terrible day. But if you give it some time, quite often when you come at the end of your year and you look at it, the focus isn't on that one day. Quite often, so much good and other things have happened that you look back and it should not be especially if you're a child of God, all be about that one day that ruined the whole year. It's about all the other good things that surpass that one bad day that you wish you could just forget. That's just one simple way to try to understand what does he mean when he says that our suffering will pale in comparison to the good things. That means there is going to be a day in the future it may be the near future for some of us. For some of us, it won't be until we're in heaven. For many of us, I believe it's a mixture of both, where we'll be able to look back and say, okay, God was in this. God meant this for good. British church leader Galvin Reed tells a story about a young man who had fallen down a flight of stairs whenever he was a baby, and his back was shattered. He had been in and out of hospitals his whole entire life. And he commented one day to this man of God that he felt like God was fair. Reed asked him, how old are you? The boy said, 17. Reed asked, how many years have you spent in hospitals because of your shattered back as a baby? The boy said, 13 years, sir. The pastor said with astonishment, and you think that this is fair? And the boy replied, well, God has all eternity to make it up to me. Wow. And he will. God promises a time when there will be no more crying, no more tears, no more pain and suffering, when we will be reunited with God in perfect harmony forever. Let the words of 1 Corinthians so deeply. 1 Corinthians 2, 7 through 9. We declare God's wisdom. A mystery that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. None of the rulers of this age understood it. For if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. However, as it is written, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love him. He's not apathetic. He does care. So we looked at the beginning of suffering, the future of suffering. Here's a good one. The end of suffering. Here's the God question. If God has the power to eradicate evil and suffering, then why doesn't he do it? There's a flaw built into the question. Just because he hasn't done it yet doesn't mean he won't, or that he's not. The Bible says that the story of this world isn't over yet. Suffering will cease, and God will judge evil. It says the day will come when sickness and pain will be eradicated, and justice will be served in a perfect way. So why the delay? Out of God's love for humanity. That's the reason why. Look at 1 Peter, uh, 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. 
Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to <laughs> repentance. It's out of his great love that he didn't say, let's end it all. He's wanting us to learn, to grow, to witness, to bring other people to him. Not to walk away from him, but to point other people to Christ. He still wants other people to be born again and trust Christ. But maybe learning about the beginning, the future, the end of suffering isn't helpful for you. Because right now you're going through something or you know you're about to. So let's talk about the now of suffering. Look at what God's word promises. Many of you can quote this verse. It's a good one, Romans 8, 28. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. And I wrote down underneath the now suffering, though suffering is a good, God can use it to accomplish good. Notice the verse doesn't say that God causes evil and suffering, just that he brings about or promises to cause good to emerge from the suffering. It means he's not apathetic. He realizes there was going to be suffering. And he said, I want to bring good out of that suffering for you. I realize it's going to happen, but I want you to know that I care. And notice the verse doesn't say we all will see immediately or even in this life how God has caused good to emerge from a bad circumstance. I know it was hard for me to understand this whole idea of God whenever I was younger. And whenever I was probably in my late teen years, God gave me what I thought was a perfect illustration. You may think it's silly. This is what I realized one day. My family's going to be like, oh no, not this story. My brother was allergic to birds, cats, dogs, anything but fur and feathers. So my first pet was a hermit crab. You'll probably hear about him one day. But moving on from the hermit crab, I had a bowl of fish. I had an aquarium. Most of my fish were guppies. When you start with two guppies, you don't keep two guppies. You end up with many guppies. But I had all these guppies. And the tanks start getting dirty. So my mom went out and she got me two algae eaters. Anyone know what algae eaters are? So we had algae eaters. They would like go up and down the side of the glass and would eat the algae and help clean up the nastiness of the tank, which I loved as a teenage boy. You know, algae eaters were my heroes. So because they were my heroes, rather than the guppies, I had to do what? Well, you gotta forgive me. No dogs, no cats, no birds. They were my pets. I had to name them. At that time, there actually was a SeaWorld amusement park in Ohio. <laughs> Um, you didn't have to go to California or Florida. In Ohio, we had our own, and it was only a couple hours away. And I remember watching this great show with seals and otters. And two of the otters had names. They were Clyde and Seymour. So I named my algae eaters Clyde and Seymour. I remember, yes, I'm sorry I ignored the guppies, but I remember waking up in the morning, and I would come and I would look in the fish tank, and I would say, good morning, Clyde, good morning, Seymour. You ask me, how did I know the difference? I did it. Probably someday Seymour is Clyde, and someday Clyde will see more. But good morning, Clyde. Good morning, Seymour. How are you doing today? It's good to see you. And I would tap on the tank to get their attention. But what would they do? Whenever I tapped on the tank, they'd swim to the other side. They would power. They would hide. And I'd be like, hey, I'm not here to hurt you. I love you so much. I just wanted to say good morning to you. And yet they would power. And then there would be, come that time when I did have to clean out the tank because now the experience is smelling. My mom's like, okay, I'm not putting it off. It's time to go ahead and clean it out. Well, you know how you do that if you've ever cleaned out a tank. What I had to do is I had to get the fish over to some fresh water to be protected while I cleaned out the tank. So what do I do? I get the net, and I'm chasing Clyde and Seymour around with the net. Clyde, slow down. Come on, Clyde, let me get you. I'm going to catch Clyde. Okay, got him. And I'm going to put him over there. Now it's time for Seymour. He's running everywhere. And all I'm trying to do is help him. You see where I'm going with this? I think a lot of times in our life, we don't understand what's going on. If something happens in our life and we're like, God is shaking things up. He's out to hurt me. He's tapping on the outside of my tank. And I'm thinking, no, leave me alone. What are you doing to me? And God's just trying to say, just saying I love you. But you don't understand. 
God, why are you chasing me down? Why are you after me with this net? Son, you don't understand, but what I'm actually trying to do is protect you. If I leave you in the situation you're in right now, it's going to get nasty, and you're going to die. It's not going to be good for you. And so what I'm trying to do, do when I'm chasing you with the net is to get your attention, to move you to something clean, so I can clean things up and to bring you back where things could be better. For one of the first times in my life, such a simple illustration, I realized Quite often, we don't see the big picture. We don't understand what God is really doing with us. But we can know this. He loves us. And whatever is happening to us, even though we might not see it when it's happening to us, God means it for good. So here's a decision we have to make. Whenever the suffering comes, we can decide whether to turn bitter or to turn to God for peace. Encourage. We could get angry at God and just leave it there and walk away and stay bitter and stay angry. Or we can realize that even though we may not see it ever on this side of earth, although we might, I believe there's some of us that can share stories that say, at the time I couldn't understand why this happened to me, but I can tell you a story now where I know how God used that to work. There's some things that we won't understand until we're in heaven one day. Why did God allow that to happen? But here's the thing. We can either allow that thing to turn us bitter or we can turn to God for peace and courage. We've all seen examples of how the same suffering that causes one person to turn bitter, causes someone to reject God or be angry or sullen, can cause another person to turn to God, be more gentle, be more loving, maybe reach out to others who have been in the same situation to them. Again, it comes down to our own choice and how we face our suffering. We make the choice to either run away from God or to run to him. From the depths of the Nazi death camp, Corey Ten Boom wrote these words, No matter how deep our darkness, he is deeper still. Every tear we shed, the Bible says, becomes his tear. Isaiah tells us he is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. I told you before, there's so many things that you could run to and run away from God when you're going through the suffering. But God wants you to do this. He wants you, when you're going through your suffering, to come to him and say, God, how could you be such a monster? He said, I was never taught to God like that. Well, then you're probably missing it. Because over and over again in the Bible, we have men of God who are coming to God and asking those very things. God, why aren't you paying attention to me? God, I'm suffering right now. See, the problem is we run away from God and run to other things instead of bringing it to God and asking him the hard questions. That's the reason you've heard me say before, I love David and the Psalms. If you're going through suffering, read some of the Psalms, the songs that were written from other people who are going through tough times. Let me draw your attention to two verses at the beginning of Psalm 28. You'll see this happen over and over again in the Bible. David cries out and says, To you I call, O Lord, my rock. Sounds like a shelter, right? But it doesn't sound like it's much of a shelter, because listen how he continues. Do not turn a deaf ear to me. You're being real with God. God, aren't you paying attention? You're my rock, but I feel like I'm stuck in here and no one can hear me from the outside, including you. Why aren't you paying attention to what I'm going through? He goes on, for if you remain silent, he's questioning God. I will be like those who have gone down to the pit. Hear my cry for mercy as I call to you for help. He's not running from God. He knows God's his rock, but he's not enjoying this shelter that he's stuck in right now. And so he's asking God, why aren't you paying attention to me? Why am I going through this suffering? And I've told you before, it seems like something is going on with David that's crazy. Like, does he have a split personality or something? Because we look just a few verses later, Psalm 28, verses 6 and 7, and he doesn't even sound like the same guy. The same guy that was just saying, God, would you please listen to me? It seems like you don't even care. You're apathetic. But in verse 6, he says, praise be to the Lord, for he has heard my cry for mercy. Lord, my strength, my shield, my heart trusts in him, and I am helped. 
my heart leaps for joy, and I will give thanks to him in his songs. I struggled with these passages before. How in the world did David bring his problem to God, but then all of a sudden say, God, I believe in you, and I trust in you, and everything's going to be okay? It's because he brought his problem to God, and I realized one day, I think what we're missing Somewhere in the middle of that scripture is whenever we bring our problems to God, which we should bring them to God, I believe God reaches down and gives us a big old hug and lets us know you brought your pain to the right place. It's going to be okay. And we're able to get up and say, praise be to God. Is I'm so glad I questioned him. I'm so glad I brought it to him. I ran to my shelter, although it's not <laughs> Now I'm protected from the storm. He promised me that, and he loves me. And then I read it one day as a poem by a man whose name is Bradley Hathaway. He wrote it like this. I read about how you touched them and they were healed. Or even if someone just touched your cloak, they were forever changed. You let a broken woman bathe your feet in her tears. Watched your best friend's feet. I'm just wondering though, did you just ever hug people? I mean, I know that is a silly question, and I am sure you would have. Why wouldn't you? But it's one of those things that was never mentioned that got me thinking about it. And however, when there was a touch from you, sins were forgiven and sickness fell. I think I'm caught up in my sins. Last time I checked, all my body parts were properly working. Nothing special here. I'm just a kid with a heavy heart. These passing sunrises and sunsets. I don't think our encounter would have ended up in the Gospels or anything. Because all I really need is a hug. That is okay for me to imagine, right? That's not going to be conflicting with any sort of theology, is it? Okay, good. Then hug me. <laughs> but not one of those sideways, one arm around the neck, neck type hugs, or the ghetto right hand clasp fist, elbows to the chest, pit pat on the back back, <coughs> or you put your right arm over my right arm and I put my left arm over your left arm and we make this weird sort of diagonal thing. Nah, none of those, man. Bear hug me, man. Take your old school carpenter arms and throw them over my upper body, leaving my arms dangling underneath yours somewhere, and I can barely move them because you are squeezing so hard. But don't pick me up and make my back pop because I hate it when people do that. <laughs> and hold me. Hold me here in your arms until I start to cry, because I want to cry. But I just can't seem to do it on my own. I've been teary-eyed once recently, but not even enough for it drip down my cheek. There's just hurt in my soul that needs to be purged. So hold me in this cold pose until the pain is flowing from my eyes and my nose. I'm gonna ask the worship team to come forward. I want to ask you this question. So when tragedy strikes as it will, when suffering comes as it will, when your pain comes as it will, and when you make the choice to run into his loving arms, here's what you're going to discover. You'll find peace to deal with the present. You'll find courage to deal with with your future, and you'll find the incredible promise of eternal life in heaven. Is God a monster? Is he apathetic? No. He cares. You need to bring your cares to him today. Let's stand. Father, we ask that you be of those who are in need of your strength and your hope this morning. Some of us may need to come forward and just cry out and say, God, I need a hug. If someone here doesn't know you as their Savior, God, I ask they might find someone and say, I need that Jesus. I need his help to help me make it through these hearts.
hard times. God, whatever it is you're dealing with us right now, God, help this be a place where we can get it cared for. We thank you for it, God. Thank you that you're not apathetic, that you're caring, and that you love every single one of us, even if we don't get it at the moment. In Jesus' name we pray.